All right, thank you so much for staying with Daybreak. You're just in time for that conversation that I mentioned earlier. We're talking about the Capedo crisis. This is a situation we've been talking about for a while now. We'd like to hear from you. What do you think is the long-lasting solutions at Trevor Mbija at Citizen TV Kenya? Use the hashtag Daybreak. Let me introduce my guest real quick. Byron Adera is here. He's an ex-Kenya Special Forces officer and also a security consultant. Thank you so much for making time. He'll tell us how that terrain looks like and what uh, it takes to be actually there. Hannah Mudoni Masharia, lecturer, School of Security and Peace Studies, Kenyatta University. University. Thank you so much for making time. And Simiu Werunga, President Advisory Council of Geneva Center for Africa Security and Strategic Studies, is joining us also on Skype in Geneva. Thank you so much for making time. Simiu, I'll start with you. We have had this discussion with you for quite some time now. Why is it such a hard nut to crack? Because the government has refused to crack it. That is as simple as, uh, uh, as it sounds. Yeah. Because uh, Trevor, Capedo is a very small triangle. And uh, I don't know that I mentioned to you. I was given work by the House of the Senate in 2015 to undertake a research on Capedo, Laikipia, and Mandela. And I took about two and a half months to do research. I sent people on the ground. We had interviews, so and uh, I shared this draft report, not the final one, draft report with the Senate, and we've discussed about Capedo for many years. The only problem we are having in our country is that the government has refused to act. It is as simple as that. See me, when you say government has refused to act, they say they are there now, the security forces. In fact, they say they know where the bandits are. In fact, hold on, let me play some, uh, a soundbite. I spoke to the regional commissioner, George Natembea, the Rift Valley regional commissioner. This is what he had to say on where the bandits are. Listen. We know where the bandits, uh, where the bandits are, and that's where we are focusing on, uh, on those areas. Of course, some of them are running away. We've got information that they're going to West Pokot and may even run away into, into Uganda. Uh, but the, 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 the luck will run out soon because even those areas were put officers on high alert. Uh, even areas of uh, Samburu and Elgeo uh, Marraquet, we've got and report some of them are running towards those, uh, those areas. We've sealed all those escape routes because we want to have a very serious discussion uh, with this with these bandits within Baringo. But they, they've been ra roaming around and killing people. Why are they now coiling their tails and, uh, and and running? Let them wait for us. We will sit down and and and, and talk, uh, so that they can get the, the message once and for all that uh, you know, killing civilians and killing security uh, officers is not an option that they that they, that they have. See me, you still think they haven't acted, and yet they are there right now. Let, let, let. Let me give you a, a small talk about statecraft. Yeah. You know, national security must be done within the realms of statecraft. Now, there's something we call political power projection, instruments of political power, and instruments of national security. The only person who can leverage those instruments is the president of the Republic of Kenya. What do we mean by instruments of political power? The president has instruments of power, which includes the military, the economy, diplomacy, and sometimes we add in finance and intelligence. But in the spectrum of Kenya, the president has the military as one element of his instruments of power. Why do we call the military an instrument of power and not the police? because the president has been given the constitutional mandate to use his instruments of power to project his political power to ensure that the protection and the lives of the Kenyan people are sustained. Now, we've had police in that area for many years, Trevor. They killed 42. They killed 21. The other day I was reading, they killed a very senior police officer. They have now killed, I think, an OCO detachment commander. How do we, in modern Kenya, allow that kind of thing to happen in a small area like Capedo? And what we hear from the minister is once and for all. What we hear from Natembea is once and for all. The government must use its leverage, must use its instruments of power. Yeah. It's not about talking, Trevor. 
the instruments of power have been consolidated under the constitution to yeah. give the president the leverage to use them to ensure that the people of Kenya are safe, secure, and are living in peace. All right. For as long as they don't do that, yeah. we hear declarations from the minister, we hear declarations from Natembea, that will not work. All right. We Steve. want the commander in chief of yeah. the defense forces and the president of the Republic of Kenya to declare that this is what the government is going to do. So that when you send there the military, yeah. I mean, obviously the police have been overwhelmed. The police have been there many times. We are not saying they are good. They are not good. We are saying they are just being overwhelmed. But you see, when you send the military, let me just finish. I know I'm talking a bit too much. Our, our, the military's rules of engagement are completely different yeah. from the police's way of engagement. We did this in 1984 in West Pocot. I was involved. I was a young officer. I was a military officer. I was an artillery officer. President Moy, the President Moy decided once and for all, go and clear the problems of West Pocot. Yeah. Trevor Mbija, we stayed in West Pocot. By the time we were walking out, it took the late Lotoda another 15 years to start talking about uh, being the paramount of Pocot. So this is what I'm trying to tell you. Yeah. We shall continue talking until cows come home, but the president must put his foot down. He must use his political leverage, yeah. must use his political instruments of power, yeah. and ensure that the issue of Capedo is dealt with once and for all. Okay. Madam Mudoni, you have also done research on the underlying forces that inform security in communal conflict areas. Your focus was in Laikipia, but what is it that we are missing here from, what you, from your research? Uh, thank you, Trevor. I think one of the things we are missing in this situation is having a, a consistent, consistent approach to the situation. Yeah. So constantly we have a once-off response, and then we pull out. And the system, like uh, Simi is saying, you leave a system that is, that is a bit weak yeah. and also lacking institutional support. So, and, and the fact that there is a lack of that institutional support then allows this group to constantly hit back. So we do need an established system. One, we need to stamp the authority of the state in this area, but we also need conversation with mm -hmm. the community member. What are these underlying issues? What are these uh, opportunistic factors yeah. that the perpetrators take advantage of? And that means once we go and leave, then there constantly remain opportunistic factors that are taken advantage of. Yeah. So what are some of these opportunistic factors that you found out? I think one uh, is uh, the, the absence of the state. Yeah. Because once there is no established system of the state in area, in terms of uh, security officers being there, then that means somebody takes advantage of saying, I, yeah. I am in charge of this area because there is no one. Then second, you have proliferation of arms. Groups that are able to hit armored vehicles, that speaks a lot. And the fact that they, they is constantly arming and rearming and it's an arms race that yeah. appear to persist, then it means there is a, a system already taking an advantage of, of, of a continuation yeah. of militarization, and specifically among the civilians, the possession of arms. That becomes opportunistic. I return an old gun, but I still keep a new one. Ah. And that means uh, that's an opportunity for me to keep rearming. Yeah. Yes. Byron, you've been in such places before. What happens on the ground? You're an ex Kenya Special Forces officer. You would know how this happens there. Of course, what happens on the ground is uh, revolves around the factors of the extension of raw power, as Simu puts it. Yeah be it uh, the military element of national power, which is an extension of the political one, as Emilio puts it, uh, then it becomes, um, of course, there's a whole uh, load of uh, considerations that are taken into, into you know, a balance yeah. with regards to the extension of that power. But uh, interestingly, it now pushes us into a region where we 
shine a strong light on the government, yeah. uh, and by extension, the figurehead of the government, as Simiu puts it. But uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of issues that are involved, even with regards to the planning processes that go into you know the equation, as regards to how uh, who is involved, the how is done, and the what is done. I think fairly much um, as we have realized, Capedo has been a household name for the longest, yeah. and sadly, there's been loss of lives, livelihoods, and, and, and several other you know, ills have had to happen, which as Madame here says, uh, has, has, has a, a, a foundation on a lot of underlying issues. You yeah. know, to, to an extent that someone uh, arms themselves and carries sophisticated weapon systems, the whole idea about disarmament for that matter has got to be pegged on the, the, the initials, you know, the backgrounds, which is why did they take up arms and why do we allow those spaces and within a space of time to have opportuni opportunities for individuals to arm themselves yeah. and you know, extend an ideology or an agenda. So it's, it's very important, by the way, and very interesting that the extension of raw power, you know, and mechanical as it may sound, may not be scoring very good goals at the end of the day because there's been presence of security operators, there's been security operations, as, as Simu puts it, dating back to you know, the 19s, okay? But then if we are just scratching the surface and being very reactive to you know, the symptoms at the, at the, at the end of, of, of the, 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 the spear, yeah. then we might be missing a big point in terms of addressing ourselves to the causal factors. Yeah. You know, interestingly, just like any other diseases like malaria, typhoid, and all the rest of it, so Seattle ills have causal factors, yeah. and they have the modes of transmission which may be presenting to themselves to us in terms of the symptoms that we see. You know, banditry, it may be uh, border issues, it may be proliferation of small arms, but they address themselves to a bigger picture, which is an agenda, which is an endearing agenda. Yeah. Uh, it could be uh, that we've had, you know, widespread marginalization of, of some spaces and, and, and within time in this country. Yeah. that we cannot address by uh, just an extension of, of, of boots on the ground or the military element or national power, as they, uh, they call it, under maybe some arrangement uh, like what we did in Mount Elgon, which we call Maka Ops, yeah. so military aid to civil authority. But then that has got to be thought through very, very thoroughly with regards to how are we going to address ourselves to the causal factor so that when we pull out or when we decide to stay on the ground and, and, and you know, be make people feel part and parcel of the country, yeah. then those are the interventions that are got, be, got to be considered side by side yeah. uh, in the grand scheme of things with regards to the way the societies are, are governed, with regards to the way we sort out the historical problems yeah. of marginalization. And then give them, them um, an, an agenda to run on. Give them something that's a winning um, you know, mindset in, with regards to the way they, uh, they socialize themselves. So that yeah. so socialization is very important. Uh, interesting, you have a, had a conversation with a, you know, a friend of mine and they were talking about how then you can challenge a kid, let's yeah. say in, in, in Pokoro, in Capedo, and they tell you, you know, flat lies because they probably are not disclosing where the parents are. Yeah. But if the response in the past was that when you went there and you had the boots on the ground, then their uncle or their parents or whoever else that were close to them were tortured or killed in cold blood. Yeah. They will not be empowered to, to speak like any other kid that we have in other spaces. Yeah. So the socialization has a lot to do with some backgrounds which we have to think through and extend you know, reasonable solutions mm -hmm. against the backdrop of history and yeah. then changes that have taken place over time. Yeah. Trust me that yesterday solutions may not be the perfect solutions to today's challenges. Things have changed over time. A lot of things have gotten to this space, and perhaps other societal ills have also reared their, 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 their head yeah. in the, the same place, churning out different challenges which may not benefit from old or, or, or you know solutions that uh, probably you yeah. know gave gave some answers. Being fielded now. Okay. Yes. Simiu, let me bring you back into this. From your research, what really is the cause of the conflict in Capello? Is this a territorial the issue? Is this banditry? Yes. What is it? The cause of uh, problems, uh, yeah. according to my research, is uh, territorial. It is boundary, it is territorial, it is economic, and it is livestock. Now, territorial, when you read the story of Capedo, and I could be wrong, I'm sure many other people have done their research, we are told that the Trucanas were taken to Capedo on their way back home 
by a certain colonial DC in around 1920. And then they never moved directly to Turkana, so they settled in Capedo. It was a small build-up area. Yeah. The Pokot say their area because they don't mm. like towns. They lived in the, in the villages, in the outskirts. So the Turkana took over Capedo. Along the way, they say that the Turkana decided saying Capedo is a, is, is a long story that has the origins in in, in land, yeah. demarcation, and ownership. So when you look at the background story of where we are today, you, you realize that actually the people who are making a lot of, uh, who, are, who are bringing a lot of fighting and problems are the, the Pokot from East Baringo. Now, my study showed me that all along the way, the government has been wavering. Yeah. Once in a while, they move Capedo into East Baringo. From some time, they move it back to Trocana. And, and that resulted in the Pokot's imagining, and I'm not speaking for anybody, this is my research, I could be wrong, Yeah. that uh, at some point they felt the government was favoring the people of Trukana than the Pokot's themselves. Now, now, when you look at the story of things on the ground, I was even, uh, I went through some notes that even the uh, IBC at that time, they had their own stations that were in Capedo, but under Baringo. We had a health center that was in Capedo, but it was under Baringo. But yeah. somehow they all changed back to Trucana, to Capedo. So it's, it's a massive, uh, uh, massive amount of information that yeah. I think the government needs to look into. So that, like I said, yes, uh, my friend there can say we need to look at society, we need to look at underlying factors. But at the end of the day, National security is not about discussion. We say you go there with two things. You go with a broom, you go with a stick. You go with a carrot, you go with a stick. Yes, there are some things the government needs to do. But there's no way, my friend, you'll tell me that we need to discuss with the people of West Pokot who are killing police officers. And we sit down with them to ask them what needs to be done. First, pacify the area take charge of the location, then discuss with the people what the problems are. That is what the government needs to do. Yes, we know, like I've told you, my research gave me a lot of background information. But I think where we are now, fast, stabilize the area, take over the government, pacify the situation, then start discussing those things that you think needs to be done. I'll give you an example. When I'm 70, decided to deal the issue of Karamojong once and for all. Yeah. You know, at first they were not listening to him. But he decided to have a two pronged uh, uh, approach. So he went and pacified the Karamojong. Yeah. He told them, I'm going to take over all the guns that you have because you are saying if we take these guns, the Trukana from Kenya and the Pokot from Kenya will come and attack you. I'm going to position a military battalion in Karamojong. And then he appointed his wife as a minister for Karamojong affairs. So yeah. what I'm trying to say is first deal with the insecurity problem, then bring in all those elements yeah. that will ensure that once you've done what you need to do as a government, then make sure that these people also have a way to live, to survive, yeah. and to continue being Kenyans. But okay. it must be done in a sequential manner so that we don't seem to be wavering in whatever we want to do in spite of the underlying factors and problems yeah. that I'm telling you, to me, just about land and demarcation. Okay. Let, let me bring in uh, uh, Madam Udoni on this, and I'd like to hear your views based on what I asked the Regional Commissioner, George Natembea, for Rift Valley on this same issue of the use of force. Which one comes first? Should you dialogue first or use force? This is what he had to say. Option. Uh, I've, I've spent almost now one and a half years in the Rift Valley as a regional commissioner, and we've held these meetings there. Uh, the last meet, this meeting we had actually all the governors uh, in the region, including uh, Nandi and Wasimigishu. 
attended that meeting, including all the senators, members of parliament. And we agreed on certain things to do. Uh, but, but the following day, these people are on the issue business and sabotaging all efforts to have peace there. So the objective that we have, we've, we've said it, we want to have of all illicit firearms yeah. uh, taken from the hands of criminals. We want the perpetrators of crime, yeah. because they are known, we want to have them arrested. Number three, we want all the stolen livestock over the years, because it's still in that area, we want it recovered. And of course, we want to destroy all the illegal settlements that have been hi acting as okay. hideouts for, for, for criminals and, and illicit firearms. Mudoni, which one comes first? Dialogue or use of force? I, I, I would think, uh, uh, Trevor, I think we need first to pacify the situation on the ground. Because the groups, these uh, armed groups operating in this area, uh, they, they're already conscious of the previous patterns. We hit an operation, so they are aware. So we need to see the government in place. And this cannot be a talk, that we come, talk, come. Because see who they are targeting. You target the security officers. And these are the agencies expected to secure the, the region. So we need to pacify the situation. We need to see the systems of security on ground. So once you create a, 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 the system that there are officers on the ground, then we can ensure community members are back. Because from what you see in the last two weeks, they're leaving. So even if you state dialogue, who are you talking to? They're leaving because of their own security. Because to them, there's no one here to secure. So we need to first pacify. And one way is to have security on the ground and a, a, and a very serious operation. Find who are these criminals? Because we cannot keep calling them bandits. They are not thieves. It's more serious than a thief. There, there is no highway to steal from. So, so we can't call them, but these are serious criminals. They are a national challenge. Yeah. So we need on the ground. We need serious uh, uh, operation yeah. on the ground because we need to flush out. Until the community member feel, now we have security in the area, we are safe, we come back. Mm -hmm. Then let's start now conversation. So what is going on? What are these factors? Who are these others who have not come back? Who are those who disappeared? Because security is also a responsibility. Yeah. Because if we say it's a right, then it means government comes, yeah. give me. But I don't have an obligation as a, as a citizen in that area to, to say who are these others who disappeared and they are coming back. So first, we need to have an operation flash out who is in the, find these arms. Yeah. Because we can't have constantly an attack and, and the kind of arms in this area, they are, they, they are, they are very serious, they are heavy armament. Yeah. Like what I found in, in my research, I found M16s on the ground, these are military guns in a community conflict area, that speaks a lot. So I, I, you can't talk with an M16 as somebody in a position of M16. You need an operation, get these arms out. Yeah. Then go to the stage now. Let's engage the community. Let's now have a, a voluntary disarmament. But from the research you did, does the community see this as intervention to help them? Or is it just another set of enemies coming through when they see the security forces? Because there's also the cultural aspect of it. What do the communities think when they see the security forces coming in? Is this coming to help them or is it just an empowered enemy? Okay, good question. I, I, I think because of the, the, the previous approach we have applied in the area, so we don't see them as friends. So we see, okay, this is, this, these are groups, these are individuals we see certain times. Yeah. And when they come in those, uh, those specific times, they don't come as, as fellow citizens of Kenya coming yeah. to serve us uh, as your as your security person i'm in charge of security so i came here to guarantee your safety because there is this threat but the approach you've seen is an intervention yeah. and it's an operation so i don't see a security officer as a friend who came to secure me i actually will draw back yeah. and second because the groups operating in this area uh, appear to be filling a void of security and then, and then there's the approach of the cultural element of who gives us security. Because if you look at this community, they do have their own constructed understanding of security. Because yeah. security is very fluid. Yeah. So we conceptualize our own understanding. Mm -hmm. And much of what you find in, in our understanding of security borrows a lot from our local vernacular words. 
and if you interpret the vernacular words of security, they have no equivalent in English. Okay. And you won't find uh, my vernacular word saying uh, crime. Yeah. But when state look at this group, they are criminals, they are, they are breaking the law. But then draw in the cultural understanding of security. You yeah. have two valiances. Yeah. And you'll find individuals saying, even if a police is here, I will still secure my people. So what are you saying? Despite having modern systems that should secure us, then I still feel I have a responsibility. And that means you, you're filling a void that is not your responsibility. And that's why, for me, Trevor, conversation cannot be the first stage of dealing with this situation. Yeah. Because you, you're dealing with a, constru a socially constructed understanding of security. Byron, what happens on the ground when the boots are sent there? You mentioned Mount Elgon. Yes. Do you get instructions that this is a scorched earth approach or what happens? Because there's a lot of humanitarian crisis issues that is coming out from there. Absolutely. It's going to be a humanitarian drama with regards to the way the operations uh, outcomes will be looked at at the end of the day. And it has a lot of bearing on, just like I said, in simple terms as regards the strategy the who, what, and the how. And, and, and the how things are done and have been done in the past is very, very critical. Of course, it's really sad that we've had to lose uh, individuals in hordes. You know, we had to lose over 40 security officers, you know, policemen, in a very sad uh, ambush uh, in the same area back in 2014. And then we are talking about another 20. And then recently we are talking about some senior security officers who were actually ambushed and killed on the 17th of January this year. Those are incidents that are unacceptable, yeah. and to make it very clear, those are incidents that have got to be addressed by having, you know, boots on the ground to pacify, identify, single out the criminals, mm -hmm. you know, and then get them out of that idea, you know. That in itself is a very, very good idea and very well intentioned, yeah. but the way things have had to happen in the past have had to score, you know, own goals and have had to score very negative, uh, again, it's very negative outcomes at the end of the day, and that's the concern. Those are the issues that I feel we need to address. Yes, with regards to the way the operational planning is done, it must be as absolutely thorough as yeah. to consider all the, you know, the issues that have got to be dealt with, how they score against uh, you know, whatever objectives we have at the end of the day. And they could be graded from you know, being scalable solutions, so short, mid, long term. And as uh, Madame has clearly said, uh, the fact that there's a constructed uh, social understanding of what all these societal ills and the needs that are, are born on the shoulders of the individuals that are living in these spaces yeah. have got to be reversed in a way that makes them understand that there's a superior narrative that we can buy into. And the full buy-in doesn't just get encouraged by having you know, intermittent presence and then you pull out. And of course, again, by having operations that are done in a very haphazard way yeah. that generates uh, you know, negative outcomes at the end of the day and leaves the societies feeling more naked and with more gaps that need to be filled by their own and of course with their own understanding. And that's why the dialogue is very, very important. The approaches and the interventions thereof, yeah. therefore, have got to be very well thought through and the planning processes need to have the individuals and all the stakeholders only you know um, as in a setting like this and where honest truth is spoken yeah. and then plans and strategies are hatched out of them and be it having boots on the ground it may be decided that and, and i've been in some of these harsh terrains and harsh areas where you know tran trainings and be it the police or the army trainings take place but baringo has been one of them yeah. you know marigat is, is a training area why not decide that we are going to have full presence of, of, of these agencies with regards to training institutions being established in those areas yeah. so that the individuals start to see that there is, you know, and, and with that you may be able to project other interventions, you know, the winning the hearts and minds of the people, extend yeah. some of the social amenities with regards to medical support, drill, you know, um, boreholes in those spaces yeah. and have full presence of the police and the army. So, they are not seen as just individuals that are coming to extend some you know, uh, power which is exotic and which may not bind to our uh, dominant aspirations in those areas. The terrains are as hard as, as they can get. Yeah. And the individuals there are in, uh, you know, we've been seeing them on, on TV, especially with regards to even the natural calamities, let alone the crisis. And you're talking floods one day, you're talking drought the next. And you and I are dragged into, you know, sending money into pay bills and things like that to support individuals therein. 
those may not be permanent solutions. And so permanent solutions need to be hatched out with regards to having a proper look at what's going on in those areas yeah. and then come out with the realistic solutions that are long term and not just band-aids which yeah. may fail you know fall short of addressing the underlying issues as well okay see me we've seen political arrests being made does this help in any way before i even get there i want to let me add on what the lady said yeah uh, you know crime there are three, is a stool of three. <laughs> so we have the perpetrator, the victim, and the society. Yeah. Uh, society creates the gaps for the perpetrator to commit a crime, and the victim is left open so that the perpetrator can commit a crime to the victim. So even as we say that we need to talk to the society, um, I mean, it is the same society that is criminals are coming from and uh, I'm, I'm old enough to know Trevor uh, we've been in that area for close to 30 years surely uh, if it is the people who are willing to work with the government so that these things are stopped once and for all this is something that I could have done many years ago I'll tell you an example we went to uh, that shows you how old I am we went to Lok Chogyo yeah. In 1989, we went to Kibish in 1989. At yeah. that time, the, the bandits had killed 15 police officers. And Trevor, they killed these officers around 11. By the time the military was getting on the ground, these officers were bones because the vultures had already eaten them, and so we were just picking bones. And we did an operation. I know sometimes the way it is done is not very professional, but that's not the intention of the commanders or the people who ask the officers and the servicemen to go on the ground. Because the way we do it also, like uh, my friend said, is different. But the issue here is it is the responsibility of the government to secure the Kenyan people and their property. If you have the audacity to ambush a police officer. You have the audacity to kill 21 police officers. You have the audacity to kill 42 or 40 police officers. Then surely you are not a person who is ready for discussion. So even as you speak about talking to the community, these criminals emanate from the community. And that's what we say. The community creates the space. It creates the perpetrators, and the perpetrators what happened. So even as we want to deal with the criminals, where they coming from? So I mean, we can talk as good as we want to talk, but at the end of the day, the government has a responsibility under the constitution to ensure we have peace and security in Kenya. So let me come to the point of politicians. One of the things that I also discovered when I was doing this research, but all cattle racing has become a commercial entity. And some of the things, some of the people who are perpetrating this were politicians. We didn't get any name, but that was a story all over the ground. So yes, there's a talk and there was a talk that politicians are part and parcel of the problem on the ground. I'll give you another example. Around the same time, I think 2013, we used to have these things so-called caravans. Yeah. Things that have never supported until today. And we went to do so many things about the, the slaughter cows and do those things and claim this thing is now over. The moment you turn your backs, not a week passes their back at each other. Yeah. So for years, discussions have, have taken place, arrested. But I'm telling you this time, yeah. even as a peace-loving Kenyan, let the government take charge. Yeah. There's something my lady friend was talking about, having ungovernable space. In, 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 culture, in, in cultural aspects, they are called, there's something we call distant decay. Yeah. 
this cell decay is this phenomenon where you start disengaging from your colleagues slowly without you knowing. Yeah. And at some point you realize you have very little in common with your colleagues. In governance, we use the, the same words. The government might be present in Capedo. Yeah. But not they are not pre present in terms of interactions, in terms of exchange. And therefore, if the camp is seen to be somewhere there, and these people are not interacting and talking to the people on the ground or doing pacification through other means using the carrots, then it becomes also very difficult for the government to do what it needs to do. So therefore, like I say, first of all, eh? yeah. settle the problem, then come up with other programs that will assist the people on the ground as the government continues to ensure they are taken charge yeah. of those spaces in capital. Okay. Baron, let me bring in on this issue, but first let's uh, uh, show you what the regional commissioner, that's George Latembea, spoke about in terms of the length of time they're willing to stay there to make this intervention count. Listen. To read, uh, that area of these criminal elements uh, has been frustrated by you know, what I'm calling political, uh, political interference as a kind of uh, propaganda. Uh, so now you have people saying that you've done this previously and just not worked. We have never done it before. Actually, the only serious kind of uh, intervention we made was in 1984, uh, when there was a serious uh, operation in West Pokot. Uh, but for East Pokot, that area of Tiati, we've never done any, uh, any, any serious operation. In spite of the fact that those guys have killed 21, uh, 21 officers in 2014, uh, in this current situation they have killed four officers who are not even in active combat. And because the government has not been able to intervene, at the level that is required, it has created a certain amount of uh, impunity uh, to the extent that some people believe that uh, they will take on government and actually uh, fight the government and defeat government. That's what some of those characters are expecting. But this time around, I'm saying we are going to, to do all it takes uh, to ensure that that, that area, um, you know, we restore normal we restore uh, law and order so that the citizen living there yeah. can also live like any other Kenyan uh, elsewhere. Byron, when you guys are on the ground, do you have a difference between punishment and restoring security? Because you hear him say that when they attack policemen, then they are daring the police officers, and now we need to teach them a lesson. Is there a difference between punishment and restoring security? In terms of what operations orders specify, uh, which we call specified tasks, uh, there is a vast array of implied, which we call implied tasks. And these uh, come about as a result of very well articulated you know, um, plans and processes and the how it's applied and when and where it's applied with regards to the objectives that are going to be met at the end of the day. So targets are very well chosen. If it's the bandits, and I'm, I'm really happy that uh, the uh, commissioner uh, did say that they know exactly where the bandits are, and they know exactly who they are. It should be then uh, a very you know, easy walk into, through these operations, and with very clearly set out objectives with regards to the way the targets are defined, the length of time, the time, uh, the operational limits of exploitation with regards to how then you know, we select the targets and signal them and address the, 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 the whole operational uh, procedures uh, with regards to the pacification, with regards to processing of criminals, because it's not just the scotch th theory that you talked about. Um, ideally, milking information and intelligence out of the perpetrators of these ills affecting Campedo is of most uh, importance as well with regards to the, the way that kind of information can be used to uh, draw up solutions that are going to be winning you know, sup and creating superior narratives that are then pushed back into the society and win <coughs> over the good ones, which is the full buy-in that we're talking about. So the vast array of interventions with regards to even the extension of operational you know, processes, you know, the extension of arms and boots on the ground, have got to engender the, you know, uh, peace and security for all at the end of the day, which means eliminate the bad guys, treat them to justice or serve justice, but then again win over the good guys. Because as been said, the void has been filled by people who are looking like they're the champions of security and safety for the, for the society as they are in, in that space. If you went in without a very well articulated operational plan and 
you know, instead of winning over the good guys and addressing, you know, the bad guys to justice, it will, it's done in a very haphazard way which then affects even the good and solidifies their resolve on the bad guys that you're trying to address, you know, and serve justice uh, on or to, then you are not scoring the good goals at the end of the day. And the operations can drag for as long as it takes. But sadly so, it may cost a lot of lives, it was a lot of lives, even to the good ones and the bad ones and even the own forces because uh, battle is not a, a contest where it's very assured as, yeah. result, as, a, as, a, as a result of the, the outcomes with loss of lives and potential loss of, uh, of livelihoods as well in the big picture. Yeah. So these are the things that we got to re articulate and think through very, very clearly with regards to the way we put boots on the ground. Sadly, we've had to see that very well-intentioned processes. And I can draw very good examples from the operation that went down in Mount Elgon, where we fought the Sabon Land Defense Forces. Ideally, yes, there were the very, very bad guys, but the operational orders, as they are, articulate what, when, and how things are happening in relation to each other, and with regards to the way the targets are identified and singled out. Yeah. So there's the whole element of uh, particularity with regards to the way the plans are, are done, and forethought with regards to the outcomes that we have to fix our minds to when, whenever you are in, in such spaces and operating, with a big picture, of course, in mind. Yeah. Uh, Mudoni, you know there's the issue of political arrest that we were talking about earlier on with CMEU. Did you find some level of cultural conflict in your research, whereby the people see these same people that are called so-called bandits as their protectors or even the heroes of the community so that if they go and take animals from one side the morans have come back and they are our heroes when the security forces come in and fight those same morans now our morans are being beaten by security officers and yet the other morans have been left and that in essentially then empowers the other morans from the other communities to come and fetch more cattle from this other side which in itself then brings conflict is there the issue of cultural conflict that needs to be addressed fast before the military set in? Uh, I think there, there is. Uh, one, on, on, on based on the fact that of the understandings communities have created about what the security means for us and who is responsible. If you look at generally our, our construct is that I'm the protected, they are the protectors. Mm -hmm. So that automatically create a gendered perspective of security that men have a role to protect us. And if they do not go to protect us, then, and you will hear women singing songs that, oh, we are not very safe. Look, this man went to radius, come back with nothing. So I, I am not safe. Because if you look at uh, much of the cultural construct of security ties the, f the longevity of a community, our future, to the role played by the male in terms of securing us and bringing cattle. Because cattle is about livelihood. And again, with cattle, it allows you to marry. And with marriage, it's about the sustainability of community because it means you can marry, you have children. So that pushes men to play a role in the society. And those who don't, you find they get a feminine label. So, so you, you're like women. So you're not able to, even where there is no threat, you're forced to take arm because you need to be seen you're not a woman. And being a woman means you, you, when the enemy does not attack you, then they'll be singing a song, look at those men. They, uh, and I remember one Samburu man shared that story. He said, we were referred as women uh, and because we could not fight back because we didn't have arms. So we had to acquire arms for our own security. And not because there was a clear threat, but I don't want to be seen as a, as a woman. Second, if you look at uh, 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 the youth, there is an association of the youth with the role they play in security. And you look, it doesn't, it's not just merely within Capendo and pastoralist community. Generally, in most of communities, if you look at uh, Anake Afote, this, these are people in their young age. So there's an association of youth with the role of playing in security. And that make them mimic the duty of providing security. Yeah. And that means even when the security is provided by the state, I still have a, 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 a responsibility as a member of my community to secure them. Yeah. 
Yeah. And even when we are saying some communities, this this hierarchy of elder, uh, the youth, uh, where the, the senior elder is no longer there, you find groups are creating their own self-protection system. Yeah. We still we, we still the group and create. Uh, what, well, uh, uh, th this uh, knighthood watch groups. Yeah. So they walk around. They are still young men. They are still youth, because because we, we we've given them a responsibility. They have a duty. They are energetic. They are young. They can walk kilometers. Yeah. Find those guys who are creating problem for us. And if you look at even when when uh, the the commissioner says we are going to find them, yeah. we, we are not likely to find an elder coming saying I was the one fighting. They may be at the back room giving the morale, giving yeah. a reason to fight. Yeah. But the primary role rests on a young With person. With young guys, okay. A and as a woman, gendering yeah. means I, I wait for somebody to secure my livelihood. And when it doesn't, yeah. then I feel I'm facing a threat. Whether it's real yeah. or whether or it's actual, it is perceived. Yeah. But I will constantly ask him, what are you doing in the house and the men are outside there? All right. Simiu, in your research, how much of cultural <coughs> conflict did you find? You know, uh, <coughs> just to add on what uh, our lady friend is, is saying, you know, social construct was about Moran's defending, not attacking. They were there to defend their community against attackers. Their role was defensive. Yeah. But these fellows metamorphosed into offensive gangsters. And that's when they lost their cultural acumen of being defenders of communities. Number two, when they were doing these defensive roles, they went to steal cattle or livestock, one for marriage, for a stocking, but they never used to kill. They never used to kill. They've left that one, they are now killing, destroying, and burning houses. So even as we speak about social constructs, about social norms, about social traditions, we must also understand that we are dealing with a completely different youth. And one so we know that this is the kind of youth we are dealing with, then we must generate measures and mechanisms on how we deal with them. I'll give you an example. I again back to Karamojo. When Museveni came up with all those things, of course we are not using Museveni because he's a Democrat, but I'm just saying, when he came up with those systems and Karamojo had been pacified for as long as I remember, why did they change? Because after pacifying the region, placing his military in the region, coming up with livelihood projects, the people changed. So while I agree that we had social constructs in our communities for the youth to defend, they stopped defending, they became offensive. And that's why I don't agree that we should be dealing with them the way we used to deal with our societies, because things have changed, Trevor. Mm. And then number two, yeah. even the way governments used to deal with our communities in those days when we used to practice genuine tradition and, and culture, it was different because we used to do it as African communities as per excellency, the way the communities used to behave. Now, when you change and you become offensive, you go to steal and kill. You go to burn houses. You go to ambush police officers. That is no longer within the community's spectrum or construct for what you are meant to be as a young person. And therefore, that's why I'm saying, yes, sometimes we might do it wrongly. Yes, sometimes when people are on the ground, they go beyond their call of duty yeah. and misbehave. Yeah. But I think as a country, we need to do it. I'll give you, let me take you briefly to Mount Elgon. Yeah. Uh, Byron, I think, was there. That time was out, but I remember we were making a lot of noise to ask the military to go there. Yes, we had many stories. Yeah. Military misbehaving, some of us were actually sacked, whatever. That is not what the commanders told the officers to go and do on the ground. Like he said, 
the mission plan is very clear mission plan is very clear this yes. is a b c d you go do this you finish you come if plan a fails go to plan b but this is what we are going to do when they go in and misbehave of course the military will take care of those people who misbehave but at the end of the day the government must be very firm very firm and finish this issue once and for all yeah did well, i answer your question yes you did well, don't you know it's just the two of us who are civilians here. The, the two of them are ex forces. Do you understand where <laughs> CBU is coming yes, from? I where do. that it says that at that point now it changed. They are no longer they can no longer be handled with the cultural gloves because and now they've turned into criminals. It's true. Do you agree with that? Yes, I do agree because if you look at a, like Simi is saying, it, it you didn't you went to raid yeah. for very and you only raided specific. And sometimes there are notifications, so you know there are signs there. And mostly you raided that what you found with no, but uh, there is no shepherd. So yeah. you take that. And when I come, I will also look specifically where there is no shepherd. But what we are seeing now, uh, uh, and, uh, and the traditional bit not have use of arms, mm -hmm. like what you're saying. So today we cannot talk the language of of uh, of culture in the security co even though we still have the title moran still remain because it's a it help us to know we are transiting from one stage to of another. our life to another yeah. but in the context of security here we cannot see this group in the language of it, it's a cultural group uh, uh, achieving a, a cultural objective the mere fact of using arms and the kind of arms i'm using here that's a criminal uh, problem yeah. we have Number two, if you look at this group, in this case there was no pre preceding attack. So it's not, we are not countering a rape that happened. Yeah. And to look at this group, so that they target, these, these are people sat down, like this, the, the cabinet secretary said, this is pre planned. Yeah. These are people who are able to track the security officers very well. And, and from what I found, they actually called those hills to them, their security points. Mm -hmm. So uh, while we might be seeing just a mere hill, to them it's a security point. So these are people who are well calculated. Yeah. They have very good training, considering they understand the terrain. Yeah. So when they shoot, they don't miss. Yeah. Two, look at when they, they hit. They, they, will, they, they will hit the tires. So meaning that officer is immobile. Yeah. And the next thing is we kill these officers. Yeah. They look at what institution. The next thing we're hearing, you have, you've killed the NAT officials. So th they are targeting specific institutions that are very key to transforming this area. Because yeah. this, this is about the teachers. Then you've hit the school, and it's very sad. Yeah. Because yeah. we've come from a situation of almost a year at home. So it's, it's a point where we are happy, our children are back to school. But you target this institution, mm -hmm. so it means you're creating another group of young people who will be back at home, and you create a, a group that can easily be attracted by these same, same groups that are attacking our security officers. Yeah. So we cannot see them as, uh, as cultural, quote-unquote, protectors. These are people who are a national concerned for this country and okay. we need to see it as that it's not a communal problem okay. it's actually a national challenge by the characteristics these groups are adopting all right byron does the, sec do the security officers what do they understand when they're told this is a special disturbed area the curfew is dusk to dawn mm -hmm. is there anything like negotiation in your language when you walk in and the boots are on the ground this is a disturbed area curfew is dusk to dawn are there any exceptions would you meet someone and ask them, so, my friend, why are you walking and it's 7 p.m.? I'm on a pit and Not at all. There's, there's uh, good training and professionalism would dictate that you exercise sound judgment. Even when that target comes within the crosshairs, you decide whether to pull that trigger or not. Uh, it could be someone who's left their home in the dead of the night because they were just sick, or it's a woman who's going to deliver in the next hostel. So enforcement of law and order, and by extension, the extension of military element or national power, and uh, some you know, um, engagement 
uh, which we called then the MAC Ops, Military Aid to Civil Authority, has got to be understood and pretty much interpreted within those professional boundaries. So yes, uh, in, in dealing with uh, you know, the so-called uh, uh, bandits, uh, if, if a person has taken up arms and he's in an area that has been marked as dangerous and, and not governable for that matter, then the operational um, uh, planning processes will mark those places as such, and the operators will get to understand their roles and the limits of exploitation with regards to the way they deal with those targets. Uh, the, the concern, as, as we've seen it in the past, there's, a bit of a bit, there's been a bit of ex excesses on the part of the way some operations have been done, and which, again, do not um, really extend that professionalism we're talking about. With regards to the way even individuals who are not uh, marked and, and seen in the light of them being criminals or bandits for that matter get to suffer the consequences that are marked may be unspecified as those that are allowable uh, to meet the, the force as, as is. Yeah. So it's, it, it's a, 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 a tight walk and there's a lot of balance that have got to be taken care of with regards to the way the operations are done. Yeah. And uh, that's why the operational planning, however uh, sharp and abrupt it is, there's, there's a lot of work that goes into putting together operations plan, which has got to specify you know, different roles and individuals have got to see themselves within that task organization as to what they actually do at the end of the day. Interestingly, even within um, that kind of setup, there's the bit that still extends, yeah. sequentially it still extends the, the carrot bit that Simu talks about. I mean, you get individuals that have been shot or caught in the crossfire, extend that carrot bit, which, is, which means ideally provide the social amenities that they depend on, whether it's shelter, whether it's treatment, whether it's medical support. And w when there that plays into the big narrative where you are uh, you know, engaging in the winning of the hearts and minds of the people, which is very, very vital for the operational objectives that are going to be uh, uh, met yeah. uh, in the grand scheme of things at the end of the day. Okay. I have to take a quick break here. When we come back, we now take closing remarks in terms of what is the way forward. I see some of your feedback. I'll uh, them right after this break.